The Walter Cronkite School of Journalism and Mass Communication at Arizona State University is honored to be a supporter of Indian Country Today. ASU offers the only online undergraduate digital media literacy degree, teaching students how to recognize and combat inaccuracies on all platforms. They are using cutting-edge tools and tactics to separate fact from fiction in a digital world overloaded with misinformation. Learn more at cronkite.asu.edu. is Indian Country Today. Esquili, yes, eh. Thank you for joining us. I'm Patty Thawahungva. Here are the headlines from Indian Country Today. Jill Biden's visit to the Navajo Nation covered climate change and health care. She spent time in Wind Rock, Arizona on Friday, the capital of the Navajo Nation. This was the First Lady's third trip there. Biden saw a copy of the treaty the Navajo Nation signed with the U.S. government in 1868. Navajo Nation First Lady Fafilia Nez thanked Biden for supporting a cancer treatment center in Tuba City. She noted it has received more patients than expected and needs to be expanded. The First Lady also made a stop at Hunter, Hunter's Point Boarding School, which is a grade school in St. Michael's near Winter Rock. And I know this has been a really hard year during this pandemic, but I see how your community has been so resilient. And I want you to know that President Biden sees you, that he stands with you, and that things will be better. So thank you again for my visit. She heard students explain the challenges they have faced with this pandemic. Interior Secretary Deb Holland marks her first time addressing the White House Press Corps as a cabinet member. She joined Press Secretary Jen Psaki at the White House for a briefing on Friday afternoon. Holland emphasized the administration's commitment to addressing climate change. I believe that a clean energy future is within our grasp in the United States, but it will take all of us and the best available science to make it happen. Secretary Holland answered questions about a pause in the new oil and gas permitting and fracking. She also spoke about federal assistance for underserved communities and preserving America's national parks. You can read more on our website, IndianCountryToday.com. The headline is Indigenous Knowledge at the White House. President Joe Biden is nominating Brian Newland to be the Assistant Secretary for Indian Affairs. Newland is Ojibwe and was born and raised on the Bay Mills Reservation in Michigan. He is also a former chairperson of the Bay Mills Indian community. Newland also served under President Obama as a counselor and policy advisor to the Assistant Secretary of Indian Affairs. He is currently the Principal Deputy Assistant to the Secretary of Indian Affairs. And in his current role, Brian Newland says much needed funding for Bureau of Indian Education Schools is on its way. The Bureau of Indian Affairs is distributing $850 million earmarked for BIE schools. The funding is coming from the American Rescue Plan Act. All BIE funded schools, K through 12, and tribally controlled colleges and universities should receive part of the funding. Newland says the support will help tribal communities recover quickly from the pandemic's wide-ranging impacts. The funding will also go to building out a learning management system and facility ventilation improvement projects. The American Rescue Plan Act is the third pandemic federal aid package for education. The internet divide is getting a little smaller for some tribes. Tribes are using federal funds to bring the internet to rural tribal towns. And that means students, entrepreneurs, and doctors in remote communities will be able to access high-speed internet thanks to Nokia technology. The Standing Rock Sioux Tribe in North and South Dakota and the Cheyenne and Arapaho Tribes in Oklahoma are building networks. This expansion started in early 2020 when the FCC offered unused wireless spectrum to tribes. The next piece of the puzzle was broadband funding from the CARES Act in March of 2020. TechRepublic.com reports Nokia and Nucor Wireless, a company that works with rural carriers, are helping with hardware and infrastructure. And now that the spectrum and funding is available, other tribes can also offer internet access to rural citizens. 
Indian Collective is announcing its second cohort of Indian Changemaker Fellows. This year, Long Fellowship is offered to 21 Indigenous people from Canada to, New to Mexico. The fellowship offers support, resources, and networking so they can help to make positive change in their communities. This year's group includes organizers, activists, and cultural practitioners whose work challenges the status quo. Gabby Strong, who is Dakota, is the managing director, and she says they are there are teachers and healers that we need for the future for future generations, and everyone thrives because of people like the fellows. Some of the work from last year's cohorts include revitalizing and protecting indigenous culture, language, and ways of life. And those are the headlines from Indian Country Today. I'm Patty Tholahungva. When we come back, the effort to get public schools to teach American Indian history. North Dakota just joined a growing list of states in that effort. Representative Ruth Buffalo joins us next. I've had the privilege of watching Representative Ruth Buffalo campaign for office. Very few politicians work harder and she brought that same commitment to her work in the legislature. Now, there's a payoff. She is the author of a bill that requir requires all North Dakota schools to teach Native American history, culture, and treaty rights. Passed the Senate earlier this month with a 72 to 21 vote. This is a significant change because state law used to leave that up to school districts about whether to teach about Native Americans. Now, it's a required subject. Representative Buffalo joins us today to talk about the new law, which is now a part of American history. Welcome, Representative Ruth Buffalo. Matsukidads, thank you. Gudagutesikids, good morning in the Hidatsa language. It's an honor to be here with you. So let me start with kind of a big picture question. Uh, Montana was the first state to do Indian education for all, and it really changed the way people see their role as citizens. Is that your hope for North Dakota? Yes, definitely. Um, we're so thankful for the solid groundwork that has been laid before us by neighboring states. Um, and so we're just excited and we are hopeful that this will, this curriculum will build bridges and bring communities together. Well, what was your reaction from your colleagues in the legislature to this idea? It was um, a variety of, of uh, responses. Um, you know, after the 47 to 47 failed vote on the House floor, March 23rd, uh, we spent about two straight hours listening and just really hearing out, um, you know, from the prevailing side, those that voted uh, against the bill, you know, a lot of their um, concerns were in the language. And so um, it, but we also received a lot of really, really good responses. And so I think people are often fearful of what they don't know or what they don't quite understand um, initially. And so we're just excited that this is moving forward and just really wanna say thank you to everyone who came out and rallied behind this bill. So we're, we're very grateful and thankful. Well, maybe tell us about the specifics of the bill. Sure. Um, this bill, you know, it was originally introduced uh, February 1st um, in the Senate Education Committee, and it went through a series of amendments. Originally, it had four weeks of uh, instruction specifically on Native American history, but coming out of the Senate, it was amended um, to be more integrated into the existing curriculum. And so, um, through this series of amendments, um, it was even split into two separate parts, uh, um, A and B, because some people, some of the legislators really favored more the uh, fourth and eighth grade North Dakota studies curriculum, which is already in existence and is already in law. Um, and so they wanted to build off of that um, piece of legislature or piece of law. But the second part was focused more, the second part of the bill was focused more on US history and high school students. Um, and the second, the third part, section three, has an effective date of 2025, and that is for graduation requirements. Um, so the incoming freshmen this August, they will be the first cohort where it will be a graduation requirement for them. And so there was a little bit of confusion there on um, thinking that the overall bill will not take uh, place or become law until 
2025, but it becomes law August 1st. And so um, everything will go into effect this, this uh, coming school year. It's funny, and that date that you mentioned is significant because we all think change happens fast, but this is one of those things that you have to look at really 10, 15 years down the road to see the impact. Exactly. And, and to that end, you know, we're so thankful for former Indian Affairs Commissioner Cheryl Kulas, who had laid the groundwork for this very curriculum uh, in 1991. And so from there, it, it grew into different areas of uh, resources through the North Dakota's Department of Public Instruction. They now have an Indian education multicultural arm. And so they have developed um, the Native American uh, essential uh, teachings, essential understandings, and I have a hard copy of it and it's online, um, but they spent a lot of time and effort, you know, to grow, grow this curriculum, grow uh, resources to be implemented into curriculum. Um, and the people who provided input to this are um, elders through, throughout North Dakota. They had made sure that there was inclusivity and in, in voices and feedback from all of the, the tribes within North Dakota. I'm struck by um, something you've said earlier that this is American history. And one of the things that really has always struck me is at the time of the signing of the Declaration of Independence, Double Ditch, a Mandan village, was one of the largest cities in North America. And yet that's not part of the I mean, every American should know that. Right. Exactly. And, you know, it's so good to be here in the, the original homelands of the Nueta Hidatsa Sanish people. Um, I myself am a citizen and a proud member. Uh, grew up in Mandaree. And so being here in the legislative session in Bismarck, North Dakota, our state, our state's capital, it's always really good to, to be back. And ever since I've been back in this legislative session, I've gone to these places that are now um, recorded as historic sites, including Double Ditch um, and Chief Lookings Village here in Bismarck area, but there's so much rich history here. And the more that we know about the lands that we stand on and reside on, I believe there's gonna be a greater level of appreciation, compassion, um, not only for each other, but for the land, you know, and the air that we breathe and the water. Um, so we're really excited. And, and thank you so much for, for um, mentioning Double Ditch. There's also another, there's a massacre that Standing Rock members had mentioned to me um, is it White, White Stone Massacre? I believe that that took place here too that not many people know about. And so we have a great opportunity to, to educate um, ourselves and future generations. So we're full of hope here. <laughs> do, you, do you think this uh, same idea will uh, make its way into higher education? I believe so. You know, I remember um, back when I was a freshman in high school, or excuse me, college, um, they offered Native American history through the humanities um, department. And so we know that through the Department of Public Instruction, their Indian education, multicultural arm, um, they have provided uh, professional development training to teacher programs in higher education. Um, so we're looking at this, you know, a very multifaceted way and comp with a comprehensive lens to make sure that we are uh, really, really moving forward in a good way and making sure that there's like no, no stone left unturned. But yes, definitely there's an opportunity, existing um, courses that are offered in higher education. I, I was struck by, and you used the word we, and I was struck by the coalition involved with this. Maybe tell us about that. Yes, um, so many different groups came together throughout the state. Um, former tribal council reps, current tribal council reps, um, and their families. And we also have here in Bismarck and in Fargo, um, they call them IPACs, Indigenous Parent Advisory Councils or committees um, that through law, you know, the Indian education programs, they, they are parent volunteers and they are just very staunch advocates for their children in these school systems. And so they have played a really important role in providing feedback. Um, in the earlier stages of uh, feedback and input and in the earlier stages of the bill drafting, um, I had reached out to different stakeholders from the different tribes. Um, so there was a lot of communication through email and uh, feedback. And so I just wanna say thank you to everybody that has come forward. You know, a lot of the, even the individuals that were a part of the 
putting together of the essential understandings, uh, Native American essential understandings, um, they also provided feedback, feedback on the earlier bill drafts. Um, Bismarck Public Schools, their IPAC, I know really rallied hard to get a Indian education director. So a lot of the grassroots movements, you know, the volunteer movement um, is also very important in this process. Um, now as a legislator, lawmaker, I'm so thankful for the amount of people who continue to come out and become educated on these processes and know that they belong in these spaces and their voice really does matter. North Dakota has a rather, well, let's just say harsh reputation across Indian country. Do you think steps like this can change that and make it a fuller picture? Yes, we're, we're hopeful. Um, we believe that education is key. And the more we know about others, the less fearful that we will be. Uh, you know, back in 2017, um, a group of us community members got together and drafted a bill on cultural competency. You know, we, we know that words and language are ever evolving, but we felt that we had to start at ground zero um, with cultural competency. We know there's cultural responsiveness, um, but we were able to find a champion to carry that bill forward for us. And that was Senator Richard Marsalais. And um, the bill died by six votes on the Senate floor, um, but it started a conversation, you know, a lot of people from all walks of life showed up to provide testimony on the importance of making sure that our lawmakers, legislators were well informed of um, the people that they're serving. Of course, we know that no one can ever be completely culturally competent outside of a culture of their own, but it still was a way to help um, lawmakers make um, comprehensive and, and better decisions moving forward. What are the next steps, Representative Buffalo? Um, the next steps right now, I know that there is a lot of uh, feedback being offered um, and just really trying to communicate where we're at, you know, the, the role of legislators and the Department of Public Instruction, you know, is to really um, make sure that you know, that we're not dictating curriculum, but to make clear that what our expectations are and what our priorities are. Um, again, and North Dakota DPI has spent years developing with North Dakota tribes the Essential Understandings Program um, that gives teachers guidance but autonomy in the incorporating this important info into their classrooms. And so we know that um, North Dakota is very big on local control and, and takes pride in that. And so we know that the teachers will be developing uh, the curriculum but implementing the resources um, that are provided through North Dakota DPI's essential understandings and teachings of our elders' resources. Thank you, Representative Ruth Buffalo. Lots of good odds. Thank you. When we come back, we'll hear from a community member in Minneapolis about the changes in police policies and what that could mean for Native Americans. The Minnesota Twin Cities is home to a large urban Indian community and a long history with police interactions. From the start of the American Indian movement in the 1970s to the murder of George Floyd last year, racism still reverberates. Joining us to comment on what it means for her family is Kate Bean. She's director of Native American Initiatives for the Minnesota Historical Society. Bean helps to strategize engagement practices with regional indigenous communities She's also the mother of two young children. Welcome, Kate. Thank you for having me. Let me start with kind of the big picture. Uh, what was your reaction to the verdict and uh, the, how it unfolded? You know, it was like this, it was like a tidal wave of relief. Um, as Native people, we're used to being weary. We're used to, to, to things not always going our way and, and our, our black brothers and sisters are, are right there with us. And there's been so much solidarity between our communities and, and across, our, across our beautiful city. Um, when the verdict was read, um, my husband and I packed up our kids and we went down to 38th in Chicago. We wanted to, them to see that historic moment. Um, and, and my daughter actually took a sweetgrass braid down and put it down there on 38th in Chicago, which is where George Floyd was murdered. Um, 
it was a teaching moment for them and it was a moment for us to breathe a sigh of relief we live near near the third precinct and near near lake street where a lot of the the um social unrest or revolution, whatever you want to call it, has um, occurred here in the Twin Cities. Um, and it's been, it's been quite a year. You, you work with uh, museums and so, so much of Minnesota and Minneapolis's history is so important in this larger story. Maybe tell us some of the things that people should know. Definitely. So, you know, this Minneapolis, which we call Bede Ota, uh, many lakes is, is this is Dakota territory. Um, Minnesota Makoche is Dakota land. Um, and our, our, our Anishinaabe, Ho-Chunk, Iowa, other, other relatives have, have um, migrated or, or lived in this area over time. But, but here in the Twin Cities in particular, our creation tells us that we're from here, uh, from, from the Minneapolis St. Paul area. And um, there is a long history of police brutality here. Uh, against Native people as well. And what we really saw was the creation of the American Indian Movement um, in the late 1960s um, really came, uh, came out of the, the, that police, that response to police brutality in, in Native territory. And the reason that we have so many Native people is that during federal Indian policies of termination and relocation, a number of Native people were moved to Minneapolis. And this was sort of a, 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 a gathering space um, was over by our, the Indian Center off of Franklin Avenue. And that continues to be a cultural corridor or a, a gathering space for native people. And what we saw was that, um, you know, the response to police brutality was the creation of the AIM patrols. Um, and those patrols protected our communities. Uh, and there's a long history of activism, there's a long history of dissent amongst the native community here in the Twin Cities. And we have a thriving native community here that stood up in solidarity with our black brothers and sisters when we saw um, that video of George Floyd being murdered. And we, we know that history, we know that story, um, we feel that story, and we also feel a responsibility to this land. This is Dakota territory. George Floyd was murdered on Dakota land, uh, and we wanted the world to know that we weren't okay with that. I'm also struck that the uh, Black community in Minneapolis recognizes and has said many times about the role of the Indigenous community in support in this particular, but even before this, that there's a long partnership. There's there is a long partnership. There's a lot of solidarity across community members. And that's not always, that has not always been the case. In fact, divide and conquer strategies were used to pit our communities against one another and have been for many, many years. But our communities have been able to relate to one another's shared history of colonization and of brutality, um, a shared history of being excluded from the historical narrative here and of um, of being forgotten by the dominant culture, which is not going to be the dominant culture much longer. There, there, there are more of us and, and, and our communities are growing and, and we're, we're working with, with one another to, to share our histories and to share our stories and to share our grievances and to stand in solidarity with one another for each other's causes. You mentioned the AIM patrols. As throughout the country, people rethink policing are there some lessons here that could apply to a broader community? Definitely. When you look at the history of AIM Patrol, these were Native community members who were supporting their community, who were protecting their community. They're protectors. And that is culturally the role of people in our community to protect one another. And when you look at AIM Patrol, when you look at these community um, these community groups that come together to, to keep each other safe, what you realize is these are people that are from the community protecting the community. And one of the issues that we've seen here in the Twin Cities was there are, that there are a lot of officers who are not from the communities that they're protecting. The, the people in those communities don't look like them um, and they don't know the community. They don't think, you know, there's the us versus them mentality versus and all of us mentality. And what we're seeing now is a call for either police reform or a complete abolishment of 
um, of the, the, the ways in which the police system operates now and a more of a focus on that community uh, protector sort of mentality. What do you think happens next in Minneapolis? Well, it's hard to say, but I know that um, our communities are coming together. Um, when George Floyd, sorry, I, I know our, our communities are coming together and I, and I do know that um, our, our histories are shared histories. And I think about when, the, when George Floyd was murdered um, and right before, the, right before the verdict was read, his girlfriend was on CNN telling the world that one of George Floyd's favorite places to go was to Bede Makaska. And Bede Makaska is White Earth Lake. That is the, the, um, the lake that, that we have uh, renamed into a Dakota name. It was John C. Calhoun, Calhoun Lake, um, who was an advocate for slavery and created the, drafted the Indian Removal Act and created the Bureau of Indian Affairs. And our people have come together um, to change the name of that lake. And that was a place that he visited. Our, our communities are connected in more ways than we even know. Kate Bean, thank you so much. Thank you for having me. And that's a slice of our indigenous world. Thank you for watching. We will be back with another edition tomorrow. I'm Mark Trahan. Sometimes you got to take a stand Just because you know you can oh, You got to run, you got to run Indian Country Today is produced at the Walter Cronkite School of Journalism and Mass Communications at Arizona State University. This is Indian Country Today.